hey, I'm really digging the new lighting system. It's allowing me to film during this long, dark Washington winter and uh, also at night without the overhead light, you know, blinding you with the glare off my head. I'm still working on my sound system, so I apologize for when that sucks. Let's talk about something that doesn't suck. Recent acquisition. Yue Sword Tachi. It's not their most expensive one by far. It's also not quite their cheapest. It's actually their second cheapest. But before we specifically look at the sword, I need to give you a, a little bit of background, context. I've never actually owned a Tachi before, but I've owned a lot of things that are very much like and inspired by Tachi, which I've shown you in other videos. The Gunto. I've also discussed my history as a martial artist that when I started out looking for a, a good Japanese style sword and not a terrible reproduction, the Gunto was what you were going to find in the States. And I also talked about how I've had to adjust my technique because it's, it's not quite a katana. Now, if you are a student of traditional Japanese swordsmanship, you'll know that your arts are built around katana primarily not tachi. They still use the word to describe their forms and techniques. And if you're a student of Japanese history, you've certainly seen them before, but not, not a lot of people use them anymore. So let's go way back for a second. There's, there's certainly a lot of other people who can tell the story a lot better than I can. Just look them up. The Shogunate has a really great piece of history on this. So the Cliff Notes version is that the Japanese started out with what were basically Tang Dynasty swords, straight blades, single and double-edged, but because their elite warriors favored cavalry combat, those just weren't working for them. So they started developing uh, longer curved, very curved sabers, just like many other cultures did, as an effective weapon from horseback. And those lasted for a long time, including in, in the centuries overlapping the development of other kinds of swords like the katana. But why did they fall out of favor? Well, several things changed. The first big wake-up call for the samurai were the Mongol invasions where they were facing large numbers of ground troops and also attacking those enemy forces on ships. Being in that kind of close quarters, those, those longer super curved swords just weren't working for them and they found themselves resorting to some of their short sword dagger backup weapon kind of things. There were also shorter cheaper swords that were designed for their their foot soldiers, their ashigaru, that were worn edge up through the waist and, and those were just methods that were easier to carry. And that was the thing, if you're in full armor on horseback, a sword slung horizontally from your hip, it's a very good orientation but for walking around or using in a close quarters situation or tight spaces, like in a building, on a ship, inside fortifications, surrounded by a mass of warriors in a town, in an alley, something like that. They needed a sword that was not only a different dimension, but worn differently. Also, as their culture and behavior changed and the sword became something that the samurai was really mandated to carry all the time, the tachi is just awkward and it's not something you can easily take on and off going in and out of a building. So a shorter, straighter sword they discovered was, was very, very useful. And that's about the time a lot of your arts that exist today were developed. For this new sword. And that includes things like Yaido, that on the battlefield you tended to have your saber in your hand. Can you draw a Tachi quickly? Yes, but it's not quite the same. So there's just a lot more usefulness they found in the katana design as an everyday carry weapon. And the Tachi got relegated to either cavalry or some of them just got shunted off to ceremony and they were some of them were kept around as, as relics and heirlooms and treasures. But, you know, even most of the surviving Tachis, they were just eventually cut down and turned into katana over the centuries. It just became the favored sword that because the samurai was carrying it all the time, that became the one they were identified with. So, 
Okay, there's your basic history. So if you are a collector today of swords, Japanese weapons, or you are a practitioner of Japanese swordsmanship, would you want one? Well, a real one is going to be a unicorn. Finding one on the market, and it's probably going to cost you as much as a new Lexus or more. So consider that. A reproduction, no. They're kind of hard to find. There's not that many people making them. Louis Sword is one, and they have about a dozen examples on their website. But just like everything else out there in the Japanese sword market on the web, you, you dozens and dozens of manufacturers and thousands of katana. It's not many tachi. So, yeah, coming across one that you like is, is going to be much more of a challenge. The other thing is they tend to be more expensive. Why? Because, well, they're elaborate. More parts, more craftsmanship, more labor in assembly. So expect the price to be higher. Let's add this one into the argument to see how you feel about it. Now, as I said, this isn't the cheapest one that the A-Sword makes. This is the second cheapest. The cheapest one is... A 9260 spring steel mono tempered blade that's mounted in, in simpler brass alloy fixtures looks very much like that Araton Type 98 that I showed in another video. So simple, reasonably attractive, uh, heavy cutting tool. Nothing too fancy for about 200 bucks. I'm, I'm not quoting an exact price, you don't have to look it up. And they do have Tachi on their website for five, six, seven, eight, nine, a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks. They can get blingy. This one, though, their second most expensive one, at least at the time I bought it, ran me about four hundred dollars. Remember that number. Actually, you don't have to remember that number because I'm probably going to keep repeating it. So for about four hundred dollars, what did I get? Well, first of all, I got a Tachi that's very Gunto like. It's not excessively curved, a little bit more so than a katana, and it's not excessively long. Very Gunto-like dimensions. 10-inch Suka, 27-inch blade. So that feels very familiar to me, and I like it. Let's talk about the construction. Starting from this end, all of the fixtures, with one exception I'll mention, are copper. And the castings are very... They're very sharp. They're very well done. They're blackened for contrast. And most of them will remind you of a Gunto. Because that's what inspired the Gunto. So if you're familiar with Gunto, this is, is going to look really, really familiar to you. For instance, it has a Kabutegane. Kabutogane. I pronounced that right? Probably not. Pommel instead of a Kashira cap with a sarute, a tassel ring. But unlike a gunto, there's no grommet through the suka to hold that. It's just sort of tack through. So that worries me a little bit. Everything else is really tight. There's no sharp edges. Everything's put together really well. The copper is reflected on all the other fixtures, except for, for whatever reason, the manuki is uh, a set of silver dragons and they're very well done i just don't know why they're not the same color so style choice anyway it's got black it's supposed to be silk ito I, I don't know if it is feels pretty good looks pretty good the the diamonds aren't very perfect but it's functional it's tight it's over real race skin it is double pinned also the sword at least the other examples I have, they seem to make their suka thinner, which for my tiny hands and especially my grip making, you know, the brace making my grip smaller, that feels great. So all good on this end. The suba is this classic tachi flower design. You'll see on a lot of reproductions and you can see how it kind of inspired the gunto. The Guntos is, is much smaller. The uh, the Tachis is katana size in diameter, but it's surprisingly thinner than I expected. It doesn't flex. It doesn't wiggle. So I expect it'll do its job. 
as we move down to the elaborate Saya, yes, it does have a copper Koiguchi, and I'm not terribly worried about that because copper is softer than steel, so it, it's not prone, in my experience, to, to messing up your blade as you're, as you're drawing and resheathing, so don't, don't worry too much about that. It holds very firmly, very snug. There's no rattle, there's no binding, it draws and sheaths very smoothly, so a very well fit. Saya. You have a double hanger system, and they're copper, with these leather riveted loops on them. And these, you can actually fit a belt through here. But the Segeo, it's not designed to tie it to an obi. This is actually designed to be the belt. And you can have other hanger systems, but traditionally, yeah, this is tied around you. Now, I haven't untied this because it's quite a puzzle. It's, it's a lot more elaborate than a Segeo presentation, not on a katana, and I haven't found any online references, so I haven't been willing to take on that challenge just yet, which uh, leaves me with a mystery. You'll see the first half of the Saya, in this case, is wrapped in Ito in a diamond pattern with a black brocade underneath it. And in another video, I showed my old Type 98 and you'll see it on the, on the rack behind me, but I'll post a picture that came to me with a, a pretty battered, destroyed scabbard. And when I redid it, I, I kind of touchified it as an aesthetic choice and also kind of a functional choice. And I did it like this, where part of it is covered in, in Ito in a diamond pattern, which both Gunto and Tachi tend to have narrow saya. So this adds a little bit of grippiness to that for indexing. I just kind of like the way it feels. I do not know. Here's the mystery. I don't know if it goes all, all the way under the Segeo. Now, I've seen other models where it clearly does. And there are models where there's none of this. So, you know, pick what you want. Now, if it turns out there isn't, I can, I can fix that. That's not a big deal. Also, the fabric, the brocade, they did leave some frayed edges. Not a big deal. That's easy to clean up. All right, moving on. The uh, very Gunto-like. Again, that's where they got the design. You've got a uh, Kojiri that matches the Kabutogane pommel. You've got the Semigane reinforcing ring with that classic flame pattern. Now, I consider the fixtures on the Shin Gunto much more elegant. These are kind of beefy, but they match the rest of the fixtures on the sword, so that's all good. Now, the paint job, this is a wood scabbard. It's not metal clad, so that makes it lighter, but maybe more fragile. The paint job, I could tell on the website from all the photos, which I perused ad nauseum as I was obsessing over whether to get this or not, I could tell it was brown and mottled, but frankly, I was not expecting Twilight Vampire Sparkly. Now, again, the theme of a Tachi tends to be bling, so it fits. And if it starts to bother me, and it doesn't right now, it fits the presentation of the rest of the sword. You can certainly get more garish versions if you look. This is pretty sedate when it comes to Itachi. So I like that. It's, it's, it's Itachi's go. It's kind of austere. Um, if it starts to bother me, I've certainly repainted Saya over and over again as I beat them up with wear and tear. So I can I can pick a new theme for it if I, if I choose to. But let's talk about the blade. What was that number again? 400? The Hibaki is a, a rounded brass fixture with a little bit of texture to it. It's, it's pretty well done. Nothing super fancy, but the blade. This is where I find that Lue Sword really shines, at least in all the examples that I have. For 400 bucks. This is a 1095-1060 Damascus blend Clay tempered, so it does have a real hamon that rates the edge at about a 60 Rockwell. So it's hard. But it's also a Sanmai lamination, which means there's a core 
of solid 1095 steel with two side panels of Damascus for added resilience that's then hammer forge welded together. Now there's a lot of concern about swords coming out of Chinese forges in mass quantities that maybe they're getting a little sloppy at times. You know, don't have the QC or whatever, but the errors happen with all smiths. There's certain unpredictable things in the forging process. But the concern is there might be some fatal flaws either in the Damascus pattern or especially in the lamination where things might come apart and your sword might shatter on you. A critical weak point. But I don't see any sign of that. I can see the transitions in the metal, both in the hamon and in the spine. They're very fine. I can also, you can't really see on my camera very well, but it does have a grain line, a hada, that's very fine. It doesn't have that big, bold, wood-looking grain that could be hiding flaws. This is a very fine grain. But one of the things you're probably noticing is that there's a big difference in the polish between the kind of mirror polished ridge plane and the edge plane, which is cloudy. Why is it cloudy? Because they finish this with finger stones for 400 bucks. Damascus clay tempered sun my lamination hand hand polished for $400. What's the result? Okay, all of, all of the planes are very even. There's no rippling or any, anything like that. Very clean blade. The Okote has this geometric quality to it. It's just really well done. That transition is nice. The Hamon is gorgeous. The polish, the grain, everything's good. Lue sword tends to make their swords very sharp. Like shaving sharp, razor sharp. And this is no exception. But more than that, they tend to be good cutters because of some design choices that I've seen, at least in the, the examples that I have. Their swords don't have a lot of meat, niku. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you've got edge planes that kind of convex out a bit, more meat in your blade means more metal behind the edge, which leads to having a stronger, more resilient edge, kind of like the difference between a razor blade and an axe. They don't do that. They tend to make a, a longer edge plane that is usually flat, which gives you a very acute edge, which is really good for sailing through soft to medium targets. It's a razor blade, not an axe. But it might make for a blade that's more fragile and easier to wreck. So, yeah, scalpel, not hatchet. Now, this one is a little different, though. I can see it a little bit at the Hibaki, but I can feel it. These, these planes aren't flat. They're slightly concave, <laughs> like a hollow grind, just, just very slightly. And I think that was something that happened between the lamination and the polish. But combine that with the fact that the blade is about an eighth of an inch narrower than a lot of other katana I've gotten off the market recently. This actually matches the, a lot of the dimensions of my old original Hanway Practical. It has kind of a skinny blade, so it's kind of light and maneuverable. It might not be the best cutter in the most sturdy thing out there, but it's really served me well, and I just like the way it feels. So let's talk about the way this thing feels. I was a little worried purchasing this sword or any sword that doesn't have a bohi because of my injury. It might be too heavy. And they weren't very specific in pounds and ounces that I'm comfortable with uh, about the weight of the blade. <laughs> so it's taking a chance. But everything put together, this sword weighs 2 pounds 3 ounces. Surprisingly light. The balance point is sitting right at 3.5 inches, which is my personal sweet spot. Add that to the length and the curve and everything. And this sword feels wonderful. It's comfortable, it's quick, it's maneuverable, it's just a joy to wield. For me, anyway. How does it cut? Well, like I said, Louis Swords tend to cut really well, but I took this out and I did what I consider my normal new sword battery. Some water bottles, some milk jugs, 
lots of cardboard. Yeah, I know you're not supposed to cut cardboard because especially corrugated stuff has a lot of abrasive material in it. Scuffs up your blade, but this didn't scuff up the blade. This time, there's no damage to the edge, no scuffing on the surfaces. And this thing sailed through all of those targets like they weren't there. Just, yeah, phenomenal cutter. 400 bucks. Really impressive sword. Now, I didn't do anything abusive with it. I didn't go out there and chop wood or anything. Probably won't. But for now, I'm really impressed. Another good reason to have faith in a sword as a good as a good dealer. So probably will go back to them again in the future. And this is a nice addition to my rotation. And I promise I'm going to get around to, I keep promising to do this series, on the use of the Gunto versus the Katana in Japanese martial arts, which will now also include the Tachi. So, so right now the light and the weather aren't totally cooperating with me, but but I promise it's coming. Until then, hope you uh, enjoyed your look at this very interesting and extremely affordable high-value piece, and um, I'll hope to see you again.